Madam President, thank you very much. Um, when I last briefed the Security Council on the 9th of April, it was an emergency meeting. And on that occasion, I warned of the dangers to regional and international peace and security arising from developments in or related to Syria. Today, it's not an emergency meeting, I know, but, but the circumstances of an emergency very much remain. Tensions, I don't need to remind you, are high, and regional and international confrontations have occurred several times, several of them. Let me just highlight some recent events since the 9th of April. On the 13th of April, the United States, France, and the United Kingdom conducted missile strikes in response to the allegations of chemical weapons used in Eastern Ghouta. Those countries say that the strikes targeted three chemical research and production facilities near Damascus and Homs. On the 29th of April, strikes were reported on Syrian government military facilities in Hama and Aleppo. Some media outlets attributed these strikes to Israel, alleging that those killed included Iranian personnel as well. Neither Israel nor Iran responded to those claims. On the 8th of May, strikes were reported just south of Damascus. Syrian state media attributed the strikes to Israel. Israel did not confirm this claim. Israel then said that he had detected, quote-unquote, irregular Iranian activity, unquote, in the occupied Golan, which it put under high alert. Between 9 and 10 May, Israel carried out dozens of strikes against presumed Iranian and Syrian government military targets across southern Syria. Israel authorities claim they are responding, they were responding, to Iranian forces firing rockets from Syrian territory at Israeli military targets in the occupied Syrian Golan. Iran condemned Israeli strikes and denied these claims. We are not in a position to independently verify every aspect of these incidents. But, frankly, even an incomplete picture demonstrates a troubling trajectory of a ever, ever more frequent and ever more intense international confrontations over Syria, unprecedented since 1973. The Secretary General has followed these developments, you know it, with great concern and has called for restraint for all parties to avoid any acts that could escalate the situation and worsen the suffering of the Syrian people. The Secretary General stressed that the UN has, quote, a duty to remind all parties of the obligation particularly when dealing with matters of peace and security, to act consistently with the Charter of the UN and with the international law in general, unquote. And on the issue of chemical weapons, let me again echo the Secretary General's call for this Council to, quote, agree on a dedicated mechanism for effective accountability for the use of chemical weapons in Syria, unquote. As of now, as you know very well, we are awaiting the results of the ongoing investigation by the OPCW fact-finding mission following their visit to Duma with uh, a report to be issued to state parties to the Chemical Weapons Convention. But we have also seen concerning developments elsewhere in Syria. Evacuations from eastern Ghouta were similarly repeated in eastern Halamun area, southern Damascus, and northern rural Homs. First, military escalation, incoming strikes, airstrikes and artillery, and outgoing towards Damascus mortars and rockets. Then, that was the pattern, then a negotiation 
followed by an agreement for the evacuation of those civilians and fighters unwilling to remain under Syrian government control or Russian Federation protection guarantees. We have also seen similar evacuations agreements being discussed in the province of Idlib, but in a completely different format, the reverse format. This time, we are talking about civilians and fighters in government control areas, basically Kefraya and Fua, now considering evacuating, starting with uh, some medical evacuation, after three years of siege and intermittent attacks from the armed groups uh, surrounding in that area. Let me share with you also um, a recurrent concern that I know all of you have. If civilians and fighters are simply just funneled into northern Syria, mostly Idlib, then this might only prove to be a postponement of a further conflict affecting many more people, and I would refer to it later on. Hence the importance of keeping a very close eye on future developments in the Idlib province. Meanwhile, civilians have continued to pay a terrible price. We are talking about 100,000, for instance, 110,000 actually, to be precise, people who have been evacuated to north western Syria and Euphrates shield areas in the past two months. Many are reportedly traumatized and in urgent need of assistance and protection. Humanitarian partners are overwhelmed and stretched quite thin by the scale of this evacuation, but continue to do their utmost to respond to the growing needs with your assistance. If we see a Huta scenario in Idlib, and here comes the point again of Idlib, this could be six times, I repeat, six times worse, affecting 2.3 million people there, of which half of them are already IDPs and who will have nowhere else to go because there is no other place to go once they are up there. But this is not purely a question of Syrian suffering. We fear that any escalation or substantial escalation in Idlib or in Dara and or in the northeast may also incur risks not only to Syrian civilians but also to international peace and security. Because as you know, many of these areas contain external and international forces. Conflict there might entail confrontation with those forces, leading us down to a slippery slope towards regional or potential international conflict. Therefore, international discussions on how to prevent this, on the escalation in particular, are needed and are taking place, but need to be very intense. I was therefore encouraged, I just returned this morning from there, to see concrete discussions on the escalation when I attended the ninth high-level Astana meeting yesterday, particularly on the issue which I referred to Idlib because on that one in particular, the three guarantors do have a say and have a capacity of avoiding it. This round in Astana did see constructive discussions on how this might be achieved. While fully keeping up front Syria's sovereignty, independence and territorial integrity, they did engage very actively in front of our own eyes on how to avoid worst-case scenario in Idlib. Also, in Astana, there was the second meeting of the working group on the release of detainees, abductees, the handover of bodies, and the identification of missing people, of which the UN is a member and a very proactive supporter, because that's what many hundreds of thousands of people in Syria are requesting and asking us to do. The working group members held constructive discussions on practical and concrete steps to address this key humanitarian issue. The guarantors informed us that they have secured the support, and that, if confirmed, is good news, of the parties for the activities taking place under the umbrella of the working group, which is a positive development. I hope we'll witness some progress because so far these are preliminary discussions, we need progress, on this complex issue at the next meeting of the working group, which 
we heard is going to take place in Ankara. Madam President, the escalation is indispensable. That's what the Syrians themselves are telling us. But it is only one of the ingredients necessary to move on the political process. What we also need is to overcome concrete challenges to a meaningful Geneva process to implement Resolution 2254. As instructed by the Secretary General, I've been consulting with a broad spectrum of relevant stakeholders and proactively identified options for a meaningful relaunch of the UN-facilitated Geneva process. Over two weeks, I conducted an exhaustive tour of consultations with the Arab League, members of the Arab League, with Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Jordan, Iraq, the EU High Representative, several key European countries, Turkey, the Russian Federation, the Islamic Republic of Iran, with members of this very council, all of you, including this very, in my opinion, productive and useful retreat in Sweden, and with the United States authorities when I came specifically to meet them in Washington a few days ago. And also with the Syrian government and the opposition, which I've been at the meeting because on the sidelines, but very useful sidelines, where they were in Astana yesterday, in the day before yesterday. My deputy, Mr. Ramsey, was also in the region this past weekend for continued political contacts with the regional players. And my chief of political affairs, Robert Dunn, has also, while we are talking, traveled to China for exchanges of views with officials of this important member of the Security Council. What did I learn from this long tour? Well, I returned to Geneva with a mixed picture. You will not be surprised. Clearly, there are significant differences still. But, but, there is also much common ground and common interest. On one, the need to de-escalate. On two, to form a constitutional committee under the UN auspices. Three, to facilitate the establishment of a safe, calm, and neutral environment, which is then leading to all what we aim at in the political process. Four, to respect Syria's sovereignty, territorial integrity, independence. These commonalities, however, risk getting lost, especially in the absence of serious international dialogue, and I will refer to this. During my tour, this was my message to everyone, robust, strong, proactive, urgent. International dialogue and consensus is now needed more than ever. To create the minimum conditions, minimum conditions, for a realistic, credible political process. We know much water has gone under the bridges, much has happened since the 2254 was adopted, so we are getting more and more realistic, but we need a credible political process which takes into account the current situation and does not forget 2254. We are not sitting idle as a secretariat in this regard. We are assessing a number of creative options to update, revive, and advance the Geneva-based political process. And let me put on record that the UN remains mobilized and ready to work on the formation of a constitutional committee according to the Sochi final declaration anytime. I therefore welcome the intention of the Astana guarantors to actively and regularly engage with the UN in Geneva so as to see a concrete follow-up to this declaration three months and a half after its adoption. I was also pleased to see a significant number of member states reaffirm the primacy of the UN-led Geneva process in general and the need for a constitutional committee working on the UN auspices while I was in Brussels at the EU-UN Brussels conference on 24-25 April. The conference was clearly almost unanimously reiterating the message that the only solution to this crisis will be political, and only this political solution will pave the way for reconstruction efforts. In Brussels, 
We also saw the entire UN system highlighting the growing needs of millions of Syrians, including IDPs and neighboring countries hosting refugees. Let me also note the important contribution of the Syrian civil society in Brussels, in particular during a side event organized by the EU and my own office. Those present did not shy away from debating with each other constructively and intensely on complex issues such as transitional justice and sanctions. They all demanded the release of detainees, abductees, and missing people. They all affirmed that any political solution must protect the right of refugees and IDPs. And despite their differences, Syrians, they were Syrian civil society. They displayed a genuine commitment to dialogue and spirit of negotiation, which I hope can be replicated in the formal negotiations. In Brussels, I also met with a group of Syrian women activists who stressed that not enough has been done to secure the direct participation of Syrian women in the political process. I committed to translating our collective commitment to this inclusion into concrete measures and will count on your support to keep the promise. For instance, when in future intra-Syrian talks, I will be insisting that a relevant number of seats will be reserved exclusively for Syrian women. When I will be criticized, I hope you will be supporting me because I know it won't be popular, but needs to be done. Finally, Madam President, let me briefly touch on an issue that was raised by the civil society in Brussels and by many Syrians elsewhere who have been writing to us. That is the possible implication of the newly adopted law number 10. We are quite aware of the concerns surrounding this law, and we and other UN partners are seeking clarifications on the law's goals and repercussions, especially in, for refugees and IDPs who do not have access to legal documentation. But, the President, let me conclude with two bottom lines. First, the escalation is critical between both the Syrian and international stakeholders, both regional and global. We hope that the relevant players can reestablish some overarching rules of the road in this regard. We stand ready to facilitate such a discussion with focused support from the Council and key countries for the good offices of the Secretary General and myself. Second, we must revive the political process in terms of constitutional committee, but also in terms of some initial steps towards establishing safe, calm, and neutral environment. We, stand, we are ready, and we stand ready to facilitate discussions on both. And let me stress that a critical component of either aspect of the political process is active, continuous, and positive United Nations engagement with the Syrian parties. I, re I repeat once again, we stand ready, and I'm saying it today as ever, to engage with the Syrian government in Damascus. We will also continue our contact with the opposition and the Syrian civil society. To unlock, unlock these two aspects, careful diplomacy is more than ever required. Careful but proactive diplomacy, including at a high level. Hence, we look with interest at the forthcoming visits to Moscow and meetings of Chancellor Melker and of President Macron later on with President Putin, which undoubtedly will not be avoiding the issue of a political process in Syria. The United Nations believes that there is an urgent need for high-level diplomacy. One, to support escalation and avoid any miscalculation and ensure a genuine communication system about a sustainable end to the conflict. With the support of the Secretary General, we shall increase our own efforts to contribute to this endeavor, including by offering further ideas and, if required, and we hope it will be required, bridging proposals. 
I will stop there. Thank you. I thank Mr. Demistura.